We are following breaking news. Deputy Mayor for Public Safety Philip Banks is holding a briefing on public safety in New York City. Let's go to it now. Okay, welcome. Before we begin, I would be remiss if we did not discuss the three unfortunate incidents that occurred yesterday in which NYPD officers responded to scenes involving armed individuals. The first with the handgun, the second with the knife, and the third with an ear gun that resembled the pistol. In one of those incidents, the person is unfortunately now deceased, and the other two, the individuals are in stable condition. Those events are still under investigation, and NYPD will provide more information in the future. The bottom line here is that there are just too many weapons on our streets. End of the story, bottom line. The NYPD and other city agencies have seized thousands and thousands of illegal guns over the past year, and we will continue to work to drive down gun violence. But the fact of the matter is, there are still too many weapons on our streets. As you may recall, last week, 103rd Precinct Officer Brett Bowler was responding to a call to investigate a dispute on the bus in Queens when a suspect shot him in the hip. A mere fight, a dispute <laughs> over a seat on a bus involved in a shot being fired on a New York City street. I just want us to think about that for a second. A dispute over a seat and a shot is fired in New York City. Officer Bowler underwent surgery at Jamaica Hospital Medical Center and was released just this afternoon, but he has a long recovery ahead of him. We're all thankful for his, he survived. We're grateful for his service. We're praying for him, and we're so well in his recovery. Today, I'm joined here by NYPD Chief of Patrol, John Shell. Chief of Patrol is responsible for patrol operations in New York City, just to keep it short. If you're 99% of the uniform, you see somebody wearing a uniform in some form of fashion, they report to John Shell or precincts report to a borough command or borough commands report to John Shell. We also have Sheriff Anthony Miranda with us, and we have a very special guest, the newly appointed rat czar, I love that terminology, the rat czar of New York City, Director of Rodent Mitigation, Kathleen Karate. As we know, public health and public safety go hand in hand, so we are very happy to have Kathleen with us here today, and we hear from her shortly. If you're watching from home for the first time today, we use these briefings to give the public a more in-depth look at what the New York City administration is doing to keep our city safe and answer some questions from the public. I encourage everyone to go on to hearfromeric.com to receive the latest updates from the mayor on the, most issue, the issues that are most important to you. Each time we hold one of these briefings, we will ask you ahead of time through emails if you have any questions you would like to have answered. And at the end of the briefing, we will answer as many of those questions as we have time for. And the ones that we don't have time for, we will get back to you. The first issue we're here to talk about today is a major concern for a lot of people, and that is the presence of these smoke shops across our city that are illegally selling marijuana products. I said the smoke shops that are illegally selling cannabis products, not smoke shops in general, because there are smoke shops who are operating lawfully. I want to make it clear what the difference here is. There are currently four legal cannabis retailers operating in New York City, three in Manhattan and one in Queens. These stores are licensed by the state, and the products that they sell are regulated. What do we mean by regulated? They're tested in the lab, so you can be sure that the product that you are paying for is a product that you'll receive, which means that aside from these four licensed locations, if you're purchasing cannabis at another shop, one, you do not know what you're ingesting. Two, the shop is operating illegally, so therefore it is a legal sale. Three, what we're going to talk about here today is that you may actually be putting yourself in danger just by being a customer in one of those stores. So we're going to talk about that briefly. As Chief Shell will detail for us in a minute, these stores have become a hotspot for robberies because they often deal in large quantities of cash. Why do they deal in large quantities of cash? Because it is still against federal law to put money into a bank if it comes from the proceeds of cannabis. So subsequently, there's a large amount of cash, and a large amount of cash attracts 
the bad guys, bad girls, or people who engage in illegal activities such as robbery. So it is a threat. In addition to just we're not sure about what, the, what you're buying or the product they're selling, it's also a haven for a lot of robbers. If we've seen several shootings that took place in smoke shops, including a homicide that occurred just past Sunday. This is an area of major concern for the mayor and the entire administration, and we know that it is a major concern for New Yorkers. The Sheriff's Office and the NYPD have been working hand in hand to crack down on these locations and do everything in our power to put them out of business. So right now, I'd like to turn it over to Sheriff Miranda to give us an overview of what his office has done thus far and what they're planning on doing. Sheriff. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. For the uh, first quarter of 2023, the total number of smoke shots inspected were 143. And compared to the first quarter of 2022, in terms of uh, smoke shop inspections, only, only 36 were conducted. That means there's been an increase of about 300% in smoke shop inspections currently being conducted. Over 2023 year to date, the number of smoke shots inspected conducted from January 2023 to April 23, there have been 162. Let me give you the numbers of what the result is. There have been a total of 46 arrests, 73 criminal court summonses issued, 249 notices of violations from the Sheriff's Office, 126 notices of violations from DCWP. The total amount of assessed civil penalties is 2,600,000. And the estimated value of items seized by the task force is over $6 million. The total number of smoke shop inspections conducted since the task force started in November have been 235 shops to date. There have been a total of 55 arrests, 148 criminal summonses, 334 notices of violation from the sheriff's office, 225 notices of violations from DCWP. And the total value, see, the total value estimated civil penalties is 4,400,000. And the estimated total value of items C since the beginning of the task force is close to $12 million of merchandise. And I'd just like to be able to say is that we can, you know, cite off stats and stats over and over again, and it certainly does show an effort, but the fact remains is that we do need help from the public. And every time we ask for the public for help, we do get it. So we're going to continue to ask. One, if you're purchasing cannabis, it may be a little bit of an inconvenience, but follow the law and purchase it from one of the four legal cannabis shops, and there are more to come. Um, and two, and please pass that information along. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the smoke shops is not solely the fact that they're illegally selling cannabis. What we're seeing now is that they're attracting criminals and fostering other illegal activities. The robberies and other crimes occurring at these shops put people's lives in danger. When those bullets fly, it's not a magnet. They fly and anyone becomes at risk. So Chief Shell, could you provide some more detail about what the NYPD's role is in these legal smoke shops enforcement and what you are seeing in relation to these locations? Sure, just let me give you some, just, just some stats to start. Right now, the in increase in smoke shops were up to about roughly approximately 1,625 smoke shops. Uh, in, in this city, a large amount. As it relates to the Deputy Commissioner mentioned, uh, robberies with smoke shops. Uh, in 2022, we finished with 140% increase in robberies with smoke shops. This year, we're, we're already pushing 50% of being, of being robbed. And what's concerning about this, and, and, and the Deputy uh, may have mentioned this, the average, um, the average money amount is about $3,000. And what compounds that also, there's obviously marijuana in the store, and there's also paraphernalia in the store. So you can get three things with one robbery. It's attractive. Uh, who's committing the robberies? Uh, unfortunately, about 30% of the people who do arrest are the age 15 to 19, which is al alarming in itself when it, when it pertains to the youth. As far as what our role is here, uh, we assist the sheriff uh, in looking at stores that come through our attention and they come to our attention as Deputy made by the public. All right, we need the public to tell us what they know about stores, who they think is dealing illegal narcotics out of stores and cannabis. Uh, we look at high volume of three and one calls throughout the city. Uh, we, we're asking the schools to get involved in terms of if they have kids that are getting sick from illegal vapes to let us know. They go to the priority, priority list on top. We look at what we have our people get sick. We fill out what we call aided cards. Who's getting sick from smoke shops? and we prioritize in that fashion. What the police department can do, 
Uh, we have administrative powers to go into the store and write summonses, uh, look around and, and only where the public can be. The sheriff has broader powers than that, but we also have other strategies that I'm not going to go too far into that we use in regards to underage sales of marijuana and uh, narcotic sales. Currently, uh, we had a, a, a hearing at, at the city council and we've kind of uh, ramped up our nuisance abatement approach. So currently there's over 60 stores that are up to be closed. They're currently in a civil court judge right now, and that's more than we had last year. In terms of presence, last year alone we had about 7,000 what we call directed patrols where a patrol car will pull up, visit the store, maybe walk the block. We had 7,000 last year, we're already at 6,000 this year. And I'd be remiss in saying that from the crime prevention point of view, uh, we have to protect this, these cannabis store owners also, we have an obligation. Uh, last year we did an all-out crime prevention last summer, just kind of letting them know what they can do to protect themselves. Buzzer system, don't leave your windows uh, with, with, with posters on it, uh, be aware of who you're letting the store late at night. So it was also a crime prevention uh, aspect to this, but definitely by the numbers I gave you, uh, it's an issue for the city, uh, there's youth involved, uh, there's cannabis involved, there's illegal narcotics involved, uh, some of the search warrants we've conducted at these locations for finding firearms. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, but uh, the city, the police department, the sheriff, and other agencies, which we're trying to combat this. Thank you. So just, you know, to take, what are the takeaways here? The takeaways here are there, listen here, if you want to purchase cannabis, make sure you know what you're getting. And you don't know what you're getting in these illegal spots, you go in there to purchase the cannabis, hey, there's a lot of cash, there's a lot of stick-up individuals who are coming in there to do that. There's a safe alternative for you to be able to purchase cannabis if that's what you're looking to do. And that's all this administration in the city is asking. So, okay, another priority. Let's move on to another topic. Another priority for the mayor and the administration is to crack down on vehicles that have fake or missing license plates, also known as ghost cars. These cars pose a serious public threat. So let's think about this for a second. Why would a person put fake license plates or fake paper plates on their car? Why, why would you do it? One, they're trying to get away with not paying their fair share of tolls. Two, they know that they're breaking the law of our roads and they're trying to avoid tickets for speeding or red light violations. Three, they don't have the proper registration or insurance to be operating a vehicle. Or four, they're trying to evade detection by law enforcement. There is no legitimate above board reason to remove, replace, or obscure your license plates. None, none that I'm aware of. So it follows that we see a strong correlation between these ghost cars and crimes they are committing in our city. It is not a harmless crime. They have them there because they're doing other things. So just like illegal smoke shop enforcement, cracking down on ghost cars is not a one person or one agency job. There are a number of different agencies in the city who play a role in getting these dangerous, untraceable vehicles off of our street. That includes the sheriff, the NYPD, as well as the Department of Transportation, the Department of Sanitation, and many others. There are rules that we have if we think the rules are unfair, we have laws and we have hearings to determine we change the rules, but then we have people who are just saying, I am not going to abide by the rules and it puts a strain on the ones that do. So this is a major concern and I'd like to ask the sheriff now to give the folks at home an overview of what his office is doing to get some of these cars off the road. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. The Sheriff's Department, again, works collectively with all of the agencies that were just mentioned. We do joint operations and individual separate operations. So in the first quarter of 2023, 162 ghost vehicles were seized, compared to the first quarter of 2022, where only 101 ghost vehicles were seized and removed from the street. The New York, City's office saw, New York City Sheriff's Office saw a 60% increase in ghost vehicle seizures. In these seizures, we also recovered firearms, narcotics, and other illegal items inside the vehicles. These include temporary plate seizures and other vehicles that have protective covers or now they have uh, shades that go across them and they have all kinds of devices that they now cover numbers or, dis or disface the license plates as well. You will see continual operations going forward. We also work with TBTA at the, uh, the uh, tunnel entrances and, and the bridges to do joint operations there where we are also expecting cars that are being driven by individuals coming across trying to evade uh, evade the law here in New York City. Okay, um, so next up is a topic that uh, I, I want the chief to talk about here. It is the legal use of ATVs, ATVs and dirt bikes on our streets. 
We hear this time and time again from the residents that these vehicles are being driven recklessly around the neighborhoods, they're not being operated at all hours of the night, and people like myself are sick of it. They go against traffic, they ride on the sidewalk, and when I was the borough commander in Manhattan Chief, it was the one quality of life issue that was actually the most challenging. You, you try to pull them over, they run, you chase them, you put innocent people, potential lives are dangerous. Total, total just a, uh, disregard for the law. And it's just, it really comes down to it's a disregard for your neighbor. You're basically saying we got rules out here and we're not gonna follow it and we are not concerned about how anybody feels about it. So, Chief, you posted a, vehicle, a video on social media last week that shows hundreds of new community response team officers who are they're fired up, I understand, and ready to hit the streets to crack down on these illegal ATVs and dirt bikes. So can you just walk through the audience exactly what we're doing about that and what we're seeing? Sure. Uh, last year, uh, in the summer, we created, uh, we created a community response team at the Chief Patrol's office, about 12 cops. Uh, we started bringing some cops in from around the city to help us out. And we took over 10,000 ATVs, dirt bikes, and illegal mopeds off the street. It was very successful. So this year, we made it official. We just rolled out in the beginning of April. Every borough has a community response team. They're a quality of life team that focuses on quality of life. And in this instance, the number one, two things we talk about here is ATVs and ghost cars. They consist of one, one, uh, one lieutenant, two sergeants, and 16 officers. Okay, and now we team up together as a city using our, 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 our aviation units, our, our, our communication networks to do it together as one city. We're all listening to each other. Uh, we span out on a hot day like today. They'll be out there today at 4 o'clock, citywide, and we're trying to stop these bikes from driving around the city. Uh, one of the things that we really uh, did a, have done a good job is now we included our highway units, our state troopers, our TBTA, and we're focusing on the bridge crossings. Because like the Deputy Mayor said, very difficult task to, to stop these bikes uh, because they don't, they don't stop. Uh, last year alone on the FDR, uh, FDR drive, I was run over by one of these ATA, ATVs in the middle of the road. Uh, they're very dangerous. Uh, so let me put this in perspective. Last night at about 7 o'clock, about 25 quads, the three-wheel quads, came off the uh, Brooklyn Bridge right by 1PP. I don't know if they were trying to send us a message, but they got back on the Brooklyn Bridge northbound on the FDR, and little did they know we were out there with highway and aviation, and we, we corralled every one of them on the FDR. And we took all their bikes. That's a strong message. That's what we're doing. And the best part about last night, no one got hurt. No chases. We boxed them in. And the FDR was backed up in traffic. And from what I'm told, people came out of the cars and started clapping for us and said thank you. That's the moral of the story. So we're going to be all over this. We are all over this. We will continue to be all over this. And I expect a very successful campaign. And Sundays, the last thing, Sundays, we surged about 300 plus officers around the city, highway, state troopers, all our equipment, and uh, it's been paying dividends for us, so. And let alone, we haven't even addressed that the injuries that they face, these individuals who are doing it, uh, that they hurt themselves, because they drive recklessly, right? We want to make sure that we're protecting them from themselves, right? So we, we want these individuals, get a motorcycle license, purchase a motorcycle, and operate your vehicle, or there may be some off-track locations that you can, you know, uh, practice your, your, your craft or your ply in, but you can't do it in the streets. It's unsafe for you, it's unsafe for the residents, the laws that we have, and we cannot have a society or a city where we're just going to disregard the laws. So please, that's the takeaway there. Getting back to the ghost cars and plates, if you see, if you walk into your regular day, you see somebody with a ghost cars, Send a text to 311. You can call 311, you can go on the website, you can text. Send a text, that information we use as data to be able to direct the resources there. Because you're paying for your toll, they're not paying for their toll. They are riding through red lights. They're riding through speeding because they have, no, they have no regard. We've seen the red light cameras and the speeding cameras. I personally don't like them, but guess what happens? The data shows that they are effective. People are alive because of, because of these red light cameras and these speeding summonses. But they're going to say, I'm not doing it. I'm just going to disregard. So how is the city we do this together? Or Max, if you see it, send us the text. Send us a 311. We utilize that data. We go out there, and we look to, to, uh, to mitigate that. And of course, when we speak about the cannabis shops, one, there's four. There's going to be many more that's coming in. Do not purchase your cannabis from a place that is selling it illegally. You are putting your life in danger with the product and the fact of just being there. 
Okay, and last but certainly not least, I am very pleased to introduce the Director of Rodent Mitigation, Kathleen Karate, otherwise known as our very first rat czar. I love that term, the rat czar. Uh, public safety is not just about reducing crime. And public safety is not just, there's a robbery, put a foot post there, right? It's certainly not just the NYPD, who everybody takes a, a role in public safety, health as well. At these briefings, we've had the Department of Sanitation, we've had the Chancellor, we've had the Department um, uh, various different what you consider other than typical and you're going to see many people from the agencies including some of our our partners from the community come up here and talk about public safety because it's not just the role of one agency to do it a large part of that has been given to law enforcement in general typical law enforcement but this problem has to be solved with all of us together and the people at home um, and the media has a role in it too, you know, reporting these stories. I, I just want to go back to what we talked about a long time ago about the lithium uh, uh, batteries. The uh, fire commissioner says there's two takeaways. Don't plug them overnight and don't have them in a place where it's an area of regress. Fortunately, recently we just lost two people from a fire, lithium batteries. It is going to happen. And to think that it's not just, well, I don't have one, but yes, you may not have one, but you may live in a building that someone who has one, right? So these are areas together, us as a team. Our differences we're gonna have, we start talking about differences, how do, we, you know, how do we solve them together? And if we spread the word properly, we can save lives and we can create what we call the mayor causes eco chamber of public safety. And part of that is uh, being clean, right? And as the mayor says all the time, he doesn't know anybody that likes rats, right? I did like the movie Ben when it came out like 200 years ago, right? I think Michael Jackson made a song about it. But no, I don't know anybody who likes rats. Public safety and public health go hand in hand. And when it comes to the cleanliness of our city, rats are public enemy number one, right? That's certainly Mayor Adams' number one enemy. Mm -hmm. So Kathy, you have a very important job here to do. We are all confident you can handle it. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your plan to send the rats packing? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Banks. You're absolutely right. New Yorkers deserve clean, rat-free streets. They pose a public health problem, destroy property, and are symptoms of a dirty city. I know that we, as a city, can improve our approach to trash and rodents and ultimately make a better quality of life for all New Yorkers. Rat mitigation is more than a quality of life issue. Rats are the symptom of systemic issues, including sanitation, ha health, housing, and economic justice. You can't just deal with one part of the problem and call it a day. We need system-wide solutions, strong leadership, and an engaged population to join the efforts. As New York City's first director of rodent mitigation, I look forward to bringing a science and systems-based approach to reducing New York City's rodent population. So how do we get this done? By disturbing the places that rats call home, cutting off their access to shelter. By disrupting the rats' food and water sources they need to survive. And by dispatching new and innovative extermination techniques, we'll look at what works and scale it up to reach more neighborhoods and more communities. And finally, we'll ensure every New Yorker is prepared with the knowledge and tools to take up the mantle in this collective effort. My background is biology and urban sustainability, but I'm a former elementary school teacher who knows behavior change and culture shifts do not happen overnight. We need to get the message to all New Yorkers. This is going to take all of us. Starting, fighting rats starts with fighting litter, garbage, and food waste. Rats love the same food we do which is why every anti-rat initiative starts with making sure food-related garbage gets into bins that rats can't. This means getting food scraps into DSMY brown composting bins and litter into waste baskets in parks and on streets. And if you see unsanitary conditions or a colony of rats, call 311 and let us know where and when, and we'll send folks to check on it. Earlier this week, we announced 3.5 million investment to fight rats in Harlem, bringing more staff and extermination techniques to our parks, schools, and NYCHA facilities. We're also going to be partnering with city agencies and the local community to ensure our streets, parks, and playgrounds are the best they can be. We've invested in cleaning across the city that will, and will continue to do so because clean, welcoming, rat-free streets are what every New Yorker deserves. 
So Kathleen, what, if you had one takeaway for the, our public who's listening to this, just the one thing that you want them to remember about what you want them to start doing today in this process, what would that one thing be? Thank you for that. Every New Yorker needs to be prepared to manage their food waste and make sure waste gets in the proper place, whether that's brown composting bins, litter baskets on your street corner, uh, cleanliness, reducing access to food is going to be our number one tool as a collective city to combat rats. Okay. Okay. Derek. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We will now take a few on-topic questions from the media related to today's presentations. Fabian. They don't listen to Fabian to you. They're going to ask the questions they want to ask. Hey, good afternoon. You spoke briefly about the uh, three police-involved shootings yesterday. Um, typically, as the weather gets warmer, we get closer to summer, we tend to see more gunplay. I don't know if you are concerned that you know yesterday's shootings were a function of that, and just sort of looking ahead to summer, how do you prepare for you know what we typically see as an uptick in, in gun violence? So, so I'll just give you just a mind. I'm going to have a chief show. Um, when I was in the NYPD, of course, the course of summer, right, more people come out, right? More people come out. Uh, it gets warmer. Uh, tempers flare. So there's always plans to look at what are we doing with the increase of people outside and violence. So you, you'll see in the warm weather, like violence tends to um, increase during the warm weather. So. Um, one, that's why, like every good police officer, I don't know if they still practice that, but it was around 400 years, they just pray for rain. They want to rain all the time. Less people outside, less trouble that they have. But we don't always have rain. We don't want rain. We want people to be out to be on the street. But we do have in this country, and I'm not making a political statement here, there are more weapons out in the street. There are more guns out in the street. We certainly have an increase in mental health. So this is just a lot of different moving parts that take place here. And we certainly want to make sure that um, we take a look at this. If we check the statistics, and I have not checked them, I'm going to be very clear about that, the NYPD um, is always in the lower end of the amount of times that they actually use their particular weapons in these particular situations, and consistently the mayor is looking at how do we make sure we get the proper training, we put the, uh, the police in a position to not use their firearm. But certainly uh, part of any type of law enforcement is to look at the changes that are occurring and it is a concern because um, the successes in not having, a, not having a situation where police officers has to use their weapon. And when we get to that as a society, things are going to be, uh, things are going to get a lot, lot better. Huh? I said no doubt yesterday was a tough day for us. We all, we all saw it and it was a warm day yesterday, about 80, uh, over 80 degrees. And that brings the warm weather brings obviously uh, more violence uh, historically. So uh, Chief Maggi, Chief of the Department, ourself, uh, the Police Commissioner, we've identified uh, 29 areas in the city that we are going to add extra resources to try to combat exactly what, what you're asking. Uh, last year we did 40. We might, we might have stretched ourselves a little much, so we, we kind of brought it down to 29, and we're really going to focus on those areas. If you look at our numbers now, our overall violence, I think uh, over a year now, even now, is down about over 15 percent. So. You know, and, we, and that same philosophy is in play right now. We focus on areas. Uh, we focus on the drivers of violence and the people, the small percentage of people that, that, that commit our violence with firearms. So we'll continue to focus on that, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue this downward trend of violence with the warmer weather approaching. On topic about what we just discussed? I mean, it is part of it. it is. We'll come back to the answer. No, 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 Faye, I'm going to ask you a question ask doesn't mean to get an answer. Ask, let her ask the question. She Thank deserves it. I appreciate she that. Deserves. I was trying to explain to him that earlier. We're talking about public safety. You're the deputy mayor of public safety. There's a GOP congressional hearing coming up this week. They argued that violence in major cities is uh, on the rise. You mentioned weapons out on the streets. I want to know what your response was to their argumentation that violence is on the rise and that they need to highlight this by having a congressional hearing. When I didn't hear that, what the rationale was for it, I don't read the papers a lot, and uh, so I didn't hear it. So if you're saying is that here, listen, here's the bottom line. If Congress is coming here because they're looking to find a solution to a problem and it's not a, uh, a type of political sideshow, then it's fine. You know, violence is an issue, and it's, it's, violence is never acceptable. When I was in the police department, we saw the decrease in violence. I remember. What the chief says, I'm not here to talk about violence that did not occur. One shooting is too much. 
So I don't know what the purpose of that is. That's a, if it's a political side, start will be part of it. But if something positive comes out that we can avoid one shooting and one incident, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to be part of anything that can reduce violence. Those bullets fly out. They don't come back. They are not magnets. So. Off. You mentioned talking to people for solutions. There are Republicans or a Democratic city. Would you say that sitting down with Commissioner Keyshawn Sewell would be one of those strategies that you mentioned? I don't know. That's a question that you would have to ask, uh, ask the commissioner uh, about it. Uh, just my relationship with her, in spite of what's written over the time, I speak to her 200 times a day, a little bit too much. She goes, I'm tired of talking to you, and says vice versa. All the time we speak all the time. That's a question for her. But knowing her, anything that, you know, her objective is the same. How do we keep the city safe? So, but I'm not speaking for her in that particular category. If there's something that's concrete, and not looking to be a sideshow, which happens, in my opinion, a little bit too much in politics, whether it's local, you know, or national, um, it's fine. Some, some of us actually really want to get to the bottom line rather than the, the, the political side show. And if it's, if it's done in the right spirit, I'm certainly for it. And, uh, and, and commission can answer that question for herself. Oh yeah, just a, a quick question for the director. Um, at this stage, do you have any strategy um, specific for the question, Anna. So the announcement of the Harlem Road Mitigation Zone, the $3.5 million we announced earlier this week, is in addition to the three existing road mitigation zones, Chinatown Lower East Side being one of those. Uh, the strategy there is the same strategy we're deploying, which is limiting f uh, food access, shelter, <coughs> um, and water access. Uh, with the road mitigation zones, our partners at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene conduct uh, more frequent uh, inspections of properties, and then that brings more attention uh, to those areas to make sure issues are being addressed. Any more questions? Great. Oh, in the back. Yes, uh, Chief Peter, Deputy Mayor, Chief. Uh, the people in the community of Yacht Brooklyn uh, a little bit concerned about the shooting yesterday. What do you see you do to uh, show the people in the community that this wasn't just a fire shooting? I'm going to let the chief answer that, but what happens is that it's, it's difficult to talk about a shooting that's still under investigation. Uh, because then your comments can be construed as something differently. So uh, I'm not going to make any comment about a shooting that's under investigation. And, but we do have to be able to say, well, when you wrap up the investigation, to speak about it, right? So it won't be used as a cover. I certainly understand that. Uh, it's an unfortunate situation when a police officer has to fire his or her weapon. And one thing that I would say, if you speak to some of these police officers that fire their weapons, they're destroyed. I mean, people think they're going home and having a party. They're destroyed, and that destroyed lives with them for a long, long period of time. Certainly, that individual, being the chief, was, was out there at the scene yesterday on that. I mean, we have a 70-year-old person who is, uh, is no longer living. So I'm not going to make any comments. The investigation is pending. It's an unfortunate situation that, that is taking place. And the, uh, the outreach that is taking place to explain preliminary what happened, and then when the investigation is done, be able to just present the facts and exactly what exactly happened here, and then what can we do to avoid that in the future. But Chief, I'm going to let you touch so on So I'm going to put this in human terms. I spoke to the officers last night. They, 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 they were very uh, upset and they were a little rattled that they were put in that kind of situation, a life and death situation in a three foot space that they had to make, they had to make that decision. And, and uh, they were very concerned and they were sad and they're, they're human beings. And, and, but they, they, they uh, that's, that's the job they took. Everything that we, we've, everything we spoke about at the press conference was, is clearly on body one camera. Thank you. Earlier this week, the administration reached out to New Yorkers, asking them to submit questions for the officials that have joined us here today. We will now get to as many of those questions as we can with the amount of time that we have left. Our first question comes from Jose in Queens for the NYPD and asks, does the NYPD work with the New York State Troopers on ghost car enforcement? Absolutely. We work, we, not only do we work with uh, our state troopers, we work with uh, my partner, the sheriff. Uh, they, they help us. They help us out on the road. They help us re, uh, try to recover these cars. They help us at the bridge crossings. They're, they're an integral part of our joint plan as it relates to ghost cars, ATVs, and illegal bikes. 
Thank you. Next question comes for the rats are from Daniel and Queens says, while we want to eliminate rats, what are some humane methods we are using for rat mitigation? Part of our approach is e examining and experimenting with all different rodent mitigation techniques. Our goal is to test them, see what's efficient, see what's scalable, and then take that citywide. Our next question comes from Anonymous in Brooklyn uh, for our rats are, uh, the owner of my building does not care about maintenance and we have a mole and rat infestation. What should I do? I think we've made it very clear. It's gonna take all New Yorkers in this effort. So everyone has a part to play in taking away rodents access to food, water, and shelter. If there's ongoing issues, I encourage you to report them to 311. Um, like the deputy mayor said, 311 is a way for us to collect data and then target resources to those specific areas. Thank you. Next question comes from Wendy in Queens for the sheriff. If these cannabis shops are legal, why can't we shut them down for good? Again, we use all the resources available to the city, but even the illegal shops have a right to due process. They have to have their date in, uh, in court, as they say, to be able to defend themselves and uh, make a plea. And that process sometimes takes a little bit longer. Um, but they do need due, due process, so that's why they don't close down from one day to the next. We have to file the proper paperwork. It takes the, the law department, the legal department of each of our agencies acting collectively to make the proper presentation, and then it goes through due process. And, that, and I just want to counter that into, you know, uh, this a lot of investigative reporting that's done. So it might be a great story to look at the process to close some of these smoke shops. Because if, and I, I, I always adopted this, if my child gets hit with a bullet, then I'm going to be the biggest activist in the world. But we can't, we can't do it beforehand. These smoke shops, people are dying just because the process, the laws need to be changed, and a lot of things need to take place. So that is something that we need to really put that attention on. And if you have to wait for your child to die or you to get shot before you take action, then, then so be it. I am not judging you. All I'm saying is that this is something that together as a city that we can work on. And these are some of the problems that we can actually, together, if that's something we want to do, make a difference on. And that was a very good question, because the process is much too long, and there are t things that we could do to be able to change that situation. Lorraine from Queens asks for the chief, does the department track motorcycles that purposefully angle their rear plate to avoid tolls or identification? We, uh, we definitely focus on motorcycles that have, that we've all seen their plate covers are bent up so not to identify their registration. Uh, as it relates to motorcycles in general, they're, they're, they're extremely difficult to uh, pull over if they don't want. But I will say this year we've taken about 860 plus of those motorcycles off the, off the streets. So we, do, we definitely do focus on it and it's, it's part of our overall illegal bike motorcycle plan. Thank you. This question is for Director Karate from Joan in Queens who asks, what can we do to keep large rats from the garden and bird feeder? I laid down rocks, planted mint, but they dug a hole and made their way back in. Food is the number one uh, attractive quality for rats. Uh, so something like a, bee, a bird feeder is rat fodder. Removing access to food will be the number one thing New Yorkers can do for their gardens and their blocks to make sure rats are not their neighbors. Next question is for the chief um, from Sujat in Queens asks, can the NYPD use drones for faster service to issue tickets for blocked driveways or breaking sanitation rules? Wow, uh, I believe that's, uh, that's not, a lot, not, not a lot to be used, but uh, I'll definitely take a look at it, but I don't think so. There are some laws that, in, that impact the use of drones in the city, and we are actively looking at ways in which we could, in the future, utilize them for that in other areas as well. But as of now, there are some federal limitations that uh, make the use of drones in New York City uh, just a barrier. And we'll see about that in the future. Our last question comes from Laura in Brooklyn for Director Karate. Will you also focus on getting rid of raccoons in our community? They are almost as bad as rats. All of our urban pests um, are looking for the same things, food, water, and shelter. 
Um, so I'll say it once and say it again, taking away food sources is going to be uh, vital for rodent control uh, and raccoon control. Thank you. On behalf of the Adams administration, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in to today's briefing. We look forward to seeing you at our next one. Have a great day.